to get a little more exercise so I'm not quite so out of breath when we've reached this point. We're in Acts chapter 13 tonight. We'll be looking at verses 42 through 45. Acts chapter 13, verses 42 through 45. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the grace of God reaching out to the Gentiles. Because of that, we are here tonight. Because you have reached out to the Gentiles and given us the opportunity to be saved by faith, according to the grace which you have so abundantly poured out upon us, we're able to be here for worship, for study of your word, for spiritual growth, for preparation for ministry, that each one of us might take the things that we have learned here and reach our cities for Christ, even as we see happening in our text tonight. We pray, Father, for your blessing on the word as it goes forth tonight, that our Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified, that he would be exalted, that we might understand better so that we can counteract those false doctrines which so easily permeate the church, so easily permeate folks who want to do right, so that we might truly understand the grace of God extended to us while we were yet sinners. So, Father, we pray for your blessings upon this time tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The message tonight is entitled, Gentiles and Jealousy. Gentiles and Jealousy. You recall that last time together we saw a very, very important, in fact, one of the most important key issues in the scripture as we move into the New Testament, which is the contrast between forgiveness of sins and the law of Moses. I'm going to start reading back a couple of verses from where our text begins tonight. I'll be reading from verse 38. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, that is Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. I've got to pause and just emphasize once again how important that verse is. Those who believe, that's faith, are justified from all things. The all things covers all things. There is not anything in the all things that is left out to be justified by the law of Moses, which is what he gives in that second half of the verse, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, that's a warning he's given them lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder. Those who think they can be justified by the law of Moses are called despisers. And wonder and perish. That's what happens to those who try to be justified by the law of Moses. They perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. The first thing that we noticed was that Paul once again referred to the Old Testament prophets here in these closing verses of his sermon. In fact, the key to his entire sermon hinged on the voices of the prophets. His argument for the predestined history of Israel hinged on the voices of the prophets. His argument for the conquest of the seven nations in the promised land hinged on the prophets. His argument for the beginning of the monarchy referred to Samuel, the prophet. His argument for the eternality of the Davidic covenant hinged on the prophets. His argument for the coming of John the Baptist hinged on the prophets. His argument for the death of Messiah and all the events leading up to and surrounding that death hinged on the prophets. His proof for the literal resurrection of Christ hinged on the prophets. At every juncture in his entire sermon, we see him referring to or quoting the Old Testament prophets. And then again in the passage I just read to you, he mentions the prophets 
Beware therefore lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. How important it is to know prophetic scripture. One third of the entire Bible is prophetic scripture and most of that is in the Old Testament. We saw that the passage he was quoting was back at 1.5 with allusions to Isaiah 29.14. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told unto you. It's clearly from Habakkuk. That's the book of faith. That's the book where we have that phrase in chapter 2, verse 4, the just shall live by faith. When we looked at Habakkuk last week, we saw that the prophet was trying to understand how God could use a wicked people like the Babylonians to judge his own people. Doesn't that seem kind of inconsistent, God? I mean, you're judging us, and yet those people are even more wicked than we are. And he asks the question, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine holy one? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment. And, O mighty God, thou hast ordained them for correction. How can you do this, God? They're the ones that ought to be getting nailed, not us. Thou art out of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? I'm sure there have been times in your life when you have looked around you and seen all kinds of bad things happening to yourself and all kinds of good things happening to the wicked. David noticed that in the Psalms. He cries out to God about it, and he gets the answer from God, but God has put their foot in a slippery place. They are about to fall. They will come under the judgment of God. We looked at that phrase, For I will work a work in your days which you believe not, though it be told you. And that, of course, was the resurrection of Christ. That was the work that had been worked in their days, and some would not believe, even though it was told to them. Paul looked at himself as the fulfillment of that specific prophecy in Habakkuk 1.5, he was the one declaring it to them, and the question was, how would they respond? And that led us to the key issue for last week. What is the relation of the law of Moses to forgiveness? Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, that is, through the Lord Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin. Paul had just argued that the resurrection was the proof that Christ has the power to forgive sins. Never forget that when you are talking to people, when you are witnessing to people. That is the proof that God has given to us that Christ has the power to forgive sins. You recall during his earthly ministry, that issue was brought into question. During his earthly ministry, there was that crippled man that he said, Son, your sins are forgiven to you, and the... Pharisees and Sadducees began to nudge each other and says, who can forgive sins but God? And Jesus could read their thoughts, and he said that you might know that the Son of Man hath power to forgive sins. He suffered unto the sick of the palsy. I say unto you, rise up, take your bed, and walk. It's easier to say your sins are forgiven than it is to heal the man with the palsy. He said, now I want you to understand why I have that power. He has given to us an even greater proof that he has the power to forgive sins. They could see that guy get up and walk. But then Jesus rose from the dead. And that is the proof that Paul has just quoted, that Christ has the power to forgive sins. We take it for granted because we've been in church all of our lives. But people... That is a shocking, astounding message. That's the message that Paul is bringing to a group of people who have never heard it before. That's why he has such a tremendous outreach in the passage that we have before us tonight. That Christ has the power to forgive their sins because he rose from the dead. That's exciting. That should give your heart a thrill that you know you have a living Savior and his power to come back from the dead is proof that he can forgive you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how many times you've done it. it. doesn't matter where you've done it. It doesn't matter how young or middle-aged or old you are. He, because of the resurrection, has the power to forgive your sins. What joy that brings to my heart. 
oh, no, I've never killed anybody. I've never done all the big bad oaths that other people talk about. But do you know one small sin separates you from God into a Christless eternity? One small, in our books, sin is enough to cause you to burn in hell forever. And if we're honest, every one of us has sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've missed the mark. We are on our way to hell unless there is some way to have that sin question settled. And God did it at the cross and proved it was true by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Magnificent. That's Paul's argument here. His death paid the penalty for sins. His resurrection is the proof necessary to show that his promise of forgiveness is true. So remember, the law is not what is necessary for the forgiveness of sins. That's the issue. The law is not what is necessary for the forgiveness of sins. The law only defines sin. The law only condemns sin. The law is not the means of forgiveness. The law is not the means of salvation or sanctification. And then we saw Paul squarely making the argument that justification is by faith alone, and that is what he states in verse 39. By him all that believe, that's faith, are justified. That's justification from all things. And Paul sets that in direct contrast to the law of Moses here. It's certain that the law of Moses never imputed righteousness to any man. It is even more certain that the law of Moses never declared any man righteous. You're not made righteous by the law. You are not declared righteous by the law. And Paul was preaching in a synagogue where the law of Moses reigned supreme. He tracked the history of Israel. He showed that nobody ever kept the law. He proved by the prophets that there must be a different mechanism for being made righteous and declared righteous by God. That's why he quoted Habakkuk. Now the Jews here in this synagogue have to make a choice. And people who sit under the preaching of the gospel have to make a choice. Yes, God has ordained all things. He has chosen his elect. But in time and space, we are held accountable for the choices that we make. That doesn't seem to make much sense for us as human beings sitting down here and not seeing things from God's viewpoint and viewing all of history and all of eternity all at once. But we know from Scripture that it's true that God has ordained all things. Not a sparrow falls without your father. The very hairs on your head are numbered. God is sovereign. But God holds you accountable for the choices that you make. And if they are wrong, God will judge you for the choices that you make. He has the right to do that. He is God. And so the Apostle Paul makes that clear to them. Here's a group of good Jews. Are they going to believe the voice of the prophets concerning justification? Or are they going to continue to try to work their way to heaven by keeping the law? Apparently they were pretty good at keeping the law. The Gentiles certainly liked what they saw. Here's a diligent group of Jews in this synagogue. They were good, upstanding citizens in the community. They were honest. They didn't cheat on their wives. They had fair business dealings. They were kind and helpful to their neighbors. Some of the Gentiles had actually come to the synagogue to try it out. The Jews were having more than a modicum of success penetrating their community for the true God of Israel. But we saw last week that that is not enough. That's why Paul preached Christ to them. You know, if you could be saved and sanctified by keeping the law, you would never need to hear Christ preached. But it wasn't enough. There's a good group of Jews. These are not the guys who are considered to be the bad guys in town. These are not the ones who are hiding out because they've just robbed the local bank. These are people who are making an impact in their community. They've got Gentiles who have started to come because they like what they saw in the Jews who were going to that synagogue. But Paul preached Christ to them. That's what they needed. It's nice to be a good citizen. It's nice to be a, a community leader. It's nice to get along with your neighbors. But that is not what gets you to heaven. Heaven. 
It is not law keeping that saves you, sanctifies you, justifies you, imputes righteousness to you. It is not the law that forgives you from your sins. What was the purpose of the law? Remember it. It proves that we're all under condemnation. It proves that no man can ever keep the perfect righteousness of God because the law is holy. Now, you know, Romans chapter 2 and Romans chapter 3 have all of the elements in them that we find in Paul's sermon. Very important to remember this because Paul deals with both Jews and Gentiles in Romans 2 and 3. He's got a synagogue at Antioch and Pisidia where he's preaching in Acts chapter 13 where he's dealing with both Jews and Gentiles. Listen to what he says. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Here we are, back to the prophets again. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace. Hold on to that word, we're going to be talking about it in a few minutes. Justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. That means to turn away sin. That's what the word propitiation means. Sin is like an arrow coming at you, and it hits the propitiation, and it bounces off. Through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. What are we dealing with in remission? We're dealing with forgiveness. Same thing that Paul's been talking about in Acts chapter 13. Remission means to send away. The sins are being sent away through the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. <laughs> Remember what Paul said in verse 39 in Acts 13? That for him that believes in Jesus, he'll be justified. That's exactly Romans 3. Paul is preaching exactly the same message that you find in this magnificent doctrinal epistle of the Apostle Paul. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Now listen to the next three verses. They're short verses, but it takes us to Acts 13. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Now there were Gentiles who had been attracted to the Jews and their synagogue because they were upstanding, uprighteous people. The Gentiles could look around their city and say, these people are different. The Jews were functioning the way that they were supposed to as a light to the Gentiles. They were functioning the way God wanted them to function in the society that surrounded them. It had attracted some people to the synagogue. But they hadn't given the full message. The full message of the Jewish prophets. That the just shall live by faith. Not by the deeds of the law. The deeds of the law don't give you life. The deeds of the law slay you. They merely point out your sin. They show you that there is a holy God to whom you must give an account. So the only way that you can be justified is by faith. Habakkuk 2.4 So many people get that wrong. They think, well, yes, uh, we see there's a holy God. Yes, we see there's a righteous God. Yes, we see there's a God who judges sin. Yes, we see there's a God who has a righteous standard in the law. And then, instead of trusting in Him and realizing they cannot keep the law... They start trying to keep the law to get right with him. Folks, it won't work. You should live a holy life, but not for salvation. You should live a holy life, but not for sanctification. And you'll discover that in the flesh you cannot live a holy life. You can only live a holy life as you walk by faith 
in the power of the Holy Spirit. Last verse, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision, that's Gentiles, through faith. Same message, same target audience, Jews and Gentiles, God bringing them both together in one, in Christ. You know, Paul used that same reasoning to counter the Galatian heresy which taught that salvation and sanctification came by the law of Moses. Now, here in this passage, he calls the Gentiles the heathen. They were being pulled into the heresy that they had to become Jews first to have access to the true God of Israel. And so Paul writes in Galatians 2 and 3, Galatians 2.16 first, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Remember, justified means to be declared righteous. So we can say by the works of the law shall no flesh be declared righteous. The law will never declare anybody righteous because you have all and I have sinned. So I cannot be declared righteous unless there is another mechanism whereby a man or a woman can be declared righteous. And Paul says that's by faith in Jesus Christ for he is righteous and he has paid for our sins. That's why we have forgiveness. That's why we have imputation. That's why we have justification. That's why we have reconciliation. That's why we have all the great doctrines of the cross, the propitiation that has turned aside the wrath of the Father. Galatians 3, beginning in verse 8, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. That's the Gentiles. That's some of those folks who were there sitting in the synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia that day preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Abraham is 2,000 years before Christ. And Paul says God preached the gospel to Abraham. The gospel, the good news. There was coming a Messiah. There was coming one who would fulfill the promise of the Proto-Evangelium that we looked at this morning in Genesis 3.15. The one who would be the descendant who would crush the head of the serpent as the serpent bit his heel the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, the scripture is a unit. It ties together from Genesis to Revelation. It all points to Christ. When we were doing the series earlier in, in the book of Acts, we saw that every book of the Bible has reference to Christ. And we went through every book of the Old Testament and showed places where in every one of the 39 books of the Old Testament there is reference, prophetic reference, to the coming of Christ. Christ is the center of Scripture. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one of whom the prophets speak. That is why it is such a powerful testimony that Paul gives here in the synagogue that day. Because the Scriptures point to Christ. Saying unto Abraham, In thee shall all nations be blessed. That is all the Gentiles. In addition to Abraham's children. In addition to Isaac's children in addition to Jacob's children, in addition to the twelve tribes' children, that in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Paul is going back and he's got a group here in front of him that is composed of Jews and Gentiles, God-fearers, Gentiles who see that there is a God in Israel who is a righteous God, who are attracted to him. Paul says the same thing in Romans. Paul says the same thing in Galatians. Paul, as we'll see in a few moments, says the same thing in Ephesians. It's the same message he preaches throughout. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. The gospel is for all nations, not just for the Jews. Down in verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. And here he quotes Habakkuk 2.4. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us. 
For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham, listen, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Do you understand how the message that Paul is preaching at Pisidia and Antioch, excuse me, Antioch and Pisidia, is the same message that he gives in each one of his New Testament epistles. The scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. We move to chapter 5 of Galatians. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are who are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Remember I said keep that little word grace in mind. The law and grace are not the same thing. There are people who try to make the law, redefine the law as grace, and try to make grace redefined as the law. The New Testament sets those two in distinct contrast one to the other. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. We saw the righteous use of the law last week. We looked at the passage over there in 1 Timothy, if you recall, where Paul says, We know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. I don't know how much more plain you can get than that. The law is not made for a righteous man. And yet, as I've mentioned on several occasions in the past, there are new books coming out right now that tell you the law is the standard for Christian living. The law is not made for a righteous man. That's what it says here. What is the law made for? It's for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. The law is made for the wicked. It shows the holy standard of God that you cannot save yourself. You cannot be justified by the law. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Do you get life from the letter of the law? Or what does it do to you? It says the letter does what? Killeth. Life comes by the Spirit. The Spirit is given to you at the moment of faith. Verse 7, but if the ministration of death, you say, what in the world was the ministration of death? I'm going to minister death to the people tonight. <laughs> the ministration of death, ah, he explains, written and engraven in stones, it was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly and behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Did you get that? The law is glorious. It's what was written on the stones. It was so glorious that Moses had to put a veil over his face because the glory kept shining out. But what does it say about it? Which was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. I say, but wait a minute, I thought that the law was righteous. Yes, the law is holy and righteous and good. But it was the ministration of death because the holy, righteous, good law killed. Paul says, before I knew thou shalt not covet, you know, I was okay. But when I heard that, the law slew me. People, the law does not give you life. The law brings death because of sin. And we are all under the condemnation of the law. We have to have a different mechanism for being made alive. We have to have a different mechanism for being made righteous. We have to have a different method for salvation. We have to have a different method for sanctification. It is not the law. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts. That's what was going on there in 
Antioch of Pisidia. They were reading the Law of Moses every Sabbath day. They were doing their very best to live according to the Law of Moses. By doing so, they were attracting the community around them as good people. But Paul tells us here, their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. That's why he preached Christ. And folks, if we preach anything else, we are not helping to take away the veil. That's why Paul went through the entire history of Israel showing nobody ever could keep the law, why they were all under condemnations, how the condemnation, how the prophets gave voice to that same thing, how the prophets predicted the death of Christ, how the prophets predicted the, the resurrection of Christ, and so our turning of our eyes must be from the law to Christ. He preached Christ unto them. He preached the resurrection unto them. He said, now you've got a choice. You're either going to believe or you're not going to believe. And if you believe, you'll be justified from all things from which the law of Moses could not justify you. Man, that's a powerful message. If we only understood it, if we could only communicate it to the people around us who all think they're going to get to heaven by their good works, who all think they're going to have some kind of a law-keeping score whereby they tally up more points in favor of themselves than the points that are against them. That's why it was a revolutionary message there in the synagogue. A group of people who were doing their very best to get to heaven, to get to God by keeping the law. Gentiles who were attracted to that by keeping the law and Paul says, that's not how you do it. The grace of God has provided something that's far better and a mechanism that will work, whereas your mechanism will not work. Oh, powerful, powerful. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, that is their heart, because he's just talking about the veil on their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The law does not give you liberty. Did you know that? The law does not give you liberty. It is the spirit of the Lord that gives you liberty. The law condemns you. The law throws you into prison. The law kills you. It is the spirit of the Lord that gives you liberty. But we all with open face, beholding in a glass as the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so it's especially important for us tonight in our Bible study to remember that there are God-fearing Gentiles present at this synagogue in which Paul is preaching. It was an active synagogue. There are some synagogues that are not. They're just social clubs. But this was an active synagogue that was reaching out to its community. It's a synagogue that was trying to proselyte Gentiles. It's a synagogue that was trying to bring Gentiles to faith in the true God of Israel. If this is, were a church, we would say that they were trying to evangelize their community. In other words, this was a Jewish group that was doing what they were supposed to be doing under Old Testament order. They were being a light for the true God among the Gentiles. And apparently, from what we see in our text... They had been successful to some extent because there were Gentiles who wanted to know more. They were talking the talk, they were walking the walk, and people were paying attention to it. It would be nice to have a, a church filled with people like that. Not to, with their motives for it, which was salvation and sanctification, but a church where people were really talking the talk and walking the walk, and others were so attracted to them that it was like a magnet sucking people through the doors of the church. I think these folks were pretty pleased with their community impact that they were making. They were also pleased that they could invite some guest speakers from Jerusalem for this citywide crusade. That is, until they lost control. Here were their guest speakers. Paul is there, and he gives them quite a good message. They probably were cheering it on and saying, Man, you're really covering the history pretty well. You're covering all the prophets and doing... You, you've got it together. They thought it was good until they lost control. We discover that in our text tonight, the whole city came together the next week, and the Jews out of jealousy. Oh, that's a dangerous one. The Jews out of jealousy opposed and blasphemed what Paul was preaching. Some of the Jews and proselytes 
did believe. And then what happened? Verse 42. When the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. They'd gone to the synagogue. They had been attracted to these Jewish righteous people. But something seemed not quite right to them. And when Paul preached, it clicked. They begged Paul to preach this stuff to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, now here is our key phrase, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. You know, there are some folks who hear, they get all excited and they fizzle out. There are some folks who hear and get excited and carry on for a while and then they get distracted by the things of the world. There are some folks who hear and the devil comes and plucks the word they've heard out of their heart. There are some folks who hear and bring forth fruit. Some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, some in hundredfold. Takes you back to what Jesus said, doesn't it? Paul has preached grace. And then after the service was over, he was getting together with some of those folks and telling them, look, you don't go back under the law. Folks have tried to go back under the law throughout all of church history. Paul is telling them, you don't go back under the law, you continue in the grace of God. Law and grace are not the same thing. He persuaded them that means he was answering questions. That means he was refuting arguments that had been made against grace. That means perhaps he was getting into some heated dialogue with people who really, really, really wanted to know, but they just weren't quite ready to go over that edge yet. He persuaded them. Do you persuade people? Or do you walk by them? Do you let them know about the grace of God? Or do you just sort of say, oh well, you know, they, they want to do it their way, so I'm not going to interfere. Paul persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. That's not bad for one sermon pulling enough people together who are so excited that they go out and tell everybody in town. And everybody in town says, man, that is a, that's an incredible message. I'd really like to hear this guy speak. They didn't have any newspaper advertisements. They didn't have any radio advertisements. They didn't have any internet advertisements. They didn't spam it to everybody in the community. That means that those Jews and Gentiles who believed that first sermon whom Paul persuaded to continue in grace that during the next six days before the next Sabbath rolled around, they were out talking to people. Does grace excite you so much that it makes you compelled to go and talk to somebody else about how good God is and look what He's done for me and look at the plan of salvation which He's provided? You don't have to keep the law to get saved. Oh, He will change your life. He will work things in your life supernaturally by the power of the Holy Spirit that will enable you to live a holy life. But you won't become holy by keeping the law. You are made holy when the righteousness of Christ is imputed to your account. And when the Spirit of God begins to control your thought patterns. When the Spirit of God begins to control your speech. When the Spirit of God begins to control your actions and your attitudes and your motives, suddenly there's a holiness that flows from the inside out rather than a holiness that you try to glue onto the outside of you and hope that it works. You know, uh, within the past few weeks, I received a, a call from a lady in Alabama. And she's a Gentile. But she's been attending what they call a Christian synagogue with her husband. The young leader is a Jewish man whom they are now calling rabbi. 
They're using all the various accoutrements of Jewish synagogue to give it a, quote, authentic flavor. Let me give you a warning. There is a new fad in the evangelical community for, quote, all things Jewish. That is, trying to have the external appearance of a first century synagogue as though that would make the church more real. Folks, being Jewish is not what makes the church real. After she called, I did a little research, came up with some studies that have been done on this new movement. And the movement, very interestingly, is composed primarily of Gentiles, not Jews, who have come to faith in Christ. They're trying to make themselves feel Jewish. Folks, you're not Jewish, and I'm not Jewish. And we love our Jewish brothers who have trusted in Christ. But God has broken down the middle of wall of partition between us. Remember those passages that talk about God preaching the gospel to Abraham? That in him would all the nations of the earth be blessed? You remember those prophetic passages that we looked at where, where God is reaching out to the heathen, that is the Gentiles, by faith, not by law, it's in the Old Testament prophets, not just in the New Testament. Don't get sucked into one of those groups that tries to make you feel like you're a little bit more superior to everybody else because, after all, you've got all the accoutrements of the Jewish synagogue. Dear folks, you are being seduced, if you do that, back under the law. It will come. It will come. Throughout history it has come. Those little things that they start with always get into the bigger things too. Be very, very careful of it. So now consider what's going on in our text tonight. The synagogue Jews were very happy with the impact they were having on their community. They've been doing their Bible studies and community outreach programs. They're getting Gentiles to attend on the Sabbath, Saturday when all the pagan football games are going on. Now, it wasn't football games, other stuff then. They thought they had everything under control. Then they invite Paul in to speak. He brings a powerful message. They say, Amen. It's based squarely on the Hebrew Scriptures. It's based squarely on Jewish history. They're pleased. But suddenly, something happens that they are not accustomed to. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit of God takes over. People start to believe. People start to get excited. People from the synagogue, especially the Gentile uh, proselytes, start witnessing to their neighbors. Suddenly it starts getting out of hand. In just a week they have the biggest meeting that their town has ever had. There's standing room only. No place to sit. Gentiles suddenly outnumber the Jews in the synagogue. And that was scary. They no longer in control of what's going on. It's not their message of conformity to the law that has pushed its way onto the stage. Suddenly it's the message of grace, not law, that has surfaced. That's precisely what the Apostle Paul preached everywhere he went. I've read to you from Romans. I've read to you from Corinthians. I've read to you from Galatians. Now listen to what Paul says in Ephesians. Same message that he was preaching at Antioch of Pisidia that day in the synagogue. You know some of these verses, but listen to it in the context of Jews and Gentiles. They're both mentioned in this text. You know some of the verses that don't mention them, and I'll start there. But listen to the development where he says this is the message both for Jews and Gentiles. For by grace are you saved through faith. Remember the word grace? He persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. He'd already told them they were justified by faith. He quoted the book of Habakkuk to prove it. For by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There it is again. Not by works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. It's not the horse, it's the cart that follows. 
The works are going to be there, but they're not for the purpose of getting saved. They're not for the purpose of sanctification. They're not for the purpose of justification. They're not for the purpose of imputation. They're not for the purpose of propitiation. They're not for the purpose of reconciliation. They are the result of salvation by grace through faith. Now listen to what he says in verse 11. Wherefore remember that in time past you were Gentiles in the flesh. Interesting, isn't it? Here we have the Gentiles. Same message those Gentiles heard in Antioch and Pisidia that day. The message that made them so excited. The message that made them realize that something was missing, even though they saw these good people there in the Jewish synagogue, that something was missing from the message. And suddenly it clicked when they heard about the resurrection of Christ and that he had the power to forgive their sins, which the law did not have. Wherefore, remember that ye being Gentiles, uh, in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision the, in the flesh made by hands, that's the Jews, Gentiles and Jews, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometime were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Verse 14, key verse. For he is our peace who hath made both, that is, Jews and Gentiles. He is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition that was between us. What was the middle wall of partition that was between them? He tells you in the next verse. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of the commandments contained in ordinances. The wall that was between them was the law of Moses. And Christ broke down the wall of partition and brought Jews and Gentiles together into one body. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both, that is, Jews and Gentiles, unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father, now he goes back and explains what God has done for us. We're all Gentiles here tonight. He explains it in verse 18 and following. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and... Here we have it again. And prophets... Paul made consistent, continual reference to the prophets. These who hundreds of years, and in some cases thousands of years, before the events happened, or will yet happen, told us what God's plan would be. And it would come to pass exactly, literally, precisely, word for word, just as God promised it in the scriptures. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God. What's a habitation? A place where somebody lives. You're the habitation of God through the Spirit. I hope that causes you to pause and think for a moment. The middle wall of partition, the law being broken down God now reaching out to you as Gentiles and extending grace to you, bringing you into the body of Christ through faith, making you a habitation of God through the Spirit. You get it? That's the message of faith and grace that Paul was preaching to the Gentiles. That was the message he preached that day at Antioch and Pisidia. The self-righteous Jews in the synagogue They'd been working on that city for years. They'd made some progress in that city. 
And suddenly the message gets changed. One week later, the citywide revival breaks out. Suddenly their own people, Jews and proselytes, have switched the legions from them and are following Paul. I think that was certainly enough to make that group of religious leaders panic, and it would make probably any group of religious leaders panic. They've worked for years and years and years and years and years and years and built up something that they think is a work for God and suddenly one special speaker comes in, the congregation follows the special speaker, suddenly citywide revival breaks out and the leaders are no longer in control. That's what happened that day. So let's make it, put it to home here. Imagine what would happen if we had a visiting speaker and within one week the entire municipality of Collingswood showed up on our doorsteps wanting to hear the visiting speaker instead of the pastor and the elders. Could we take that with grace? So how did these leaders respond? Instead of praising God, they used the only trick they had in their book. They denied, even though it meant blaspheming God because what they were denying was the resurrection of Christ the most powerful event in history since the creation of the universe. When the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached unto them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath they came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Not to hear some very interesting speaker, they came together to hear what? The Word of God. Dear people, it's the Word of God that has power. It's the Word of God that has impact. It's the Word of God that changes lives. It's the Word of God that draws us to salvation. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God. Don't preach anything else. Preach Christ. Preach the Word of God. That is what God uses when He chooses to cause revival to break out. What God uses is the Word of God. Not our funny stories, not our jokes, not our testimonies, not our sad sob stories, not all of our you know, manipulations of the crowd with soft music and dim lights. It is the Word of God that changes lives, and that's what happened in Antioch of Pisidia. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, you know, multitudes are exciting. Multitudes are what every pastor wants. Multitudes are what every church leader wants. Multitudes are what every board of trustee wants because then the giving is good. They saw the multitudes and something began to rankle in their hearts. They started to envy. They started to get jealous. They started to say, now look, we've worked at this for years. How come that guy is getting such a response? That's not fair. We're the ones who've done the work. God doesn't care. When you are self-centered, when you think you're it, when you think you are the key to success, God is going to teach you a lesson. There is no success unless His hand is in it. And so they were filled with envy. Envy does bad things to you folks. Envy and jealousy, they twist you the wrong way. They make you not think right. They conflict with the working of the Holy Spirit in your heart. Envy is listed as one of the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5. Interesting. An epistle to Gentiles who are being told not to fall back under the law. And it's one of the works of the flesh that's listed in Galatians chapter 5. Envy is what moved the brothers of Joseph in Acts chapter 7, verse 9, which moved the brothers of Joseph to sell him into slavery. It says so in Stephen's sermon, Acts 7, 9. His brothers were moved with envy. It's not just that they wanted what he had, they wanted to destroy what he had. And that's what's going on here in the synagogue that day. They were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul. What had Paul been preaching? They didn't speak against the history of Israel. They didn't speak against the prophets of the Old Testament. They spoke against what Paul told them 
He was the messenger bringing them the news that they would not believe concerning the resurrection of Christ. That's what they spoke against. That's what many today are speaking against. Well, Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. That's what the liberals say, that it was just a, the resurrection idea that motivated people to like each other. Listen, folks, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, you have no hope. That's what they were speaking against. That's what they were blaspheming and contradicting. No, it couldn't possibly be because how Paul is tied it together, he proves that it is God himself who has done this. They were speaking against what God himself had done. Grace is the message that people need to hear. Sinners need grace. Grace is extended to us as we are guilty. Yes, God is holy. Yes, God is just and will send people to hell. But God is a God of grace who has made full provision for those who are lost so that by the easiest method possible they can experience His forgiveness and His salvation by faith alone in the risen Christ of Scripture. God's grace. What is the message that you are preaching to those around you? Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your grace, for the goodness that has been extended to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and he has forgiven us for our sins. We've been cleansed and washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Magnificent, wonderful, eternal promises. Promises that give us hope because you are a God of grace. Bless us as we take this your word and go to those who are around us as we get excited about hearing the message of grace, about hearing the resurrection of Jesus Christ, of people so excited that this place would be filled next week if we had the same excitement that those Jews who believed and the proselytes who believed had as they tried to bring others in to hear that marvelous message of the grace of God. Father, this is your word. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymnals and turn to our closing hymn tonight. Much wonderful grace that God has given to us.